Last week, we kicked off this new 2020 vision sermon series with the mystery. Um, Ephesians 3, 8 to 10, let me read that again to remind you. To me, the very least of all the saints, grace, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities of the heavenly places. So that the manifold wisdom of God could be made known to the heavenly places through the church. That is the point of our salvation. Our, our salvation is not about us. That's kind of, you know, what we started talking about. You know, this, this, this is the mystery of Christ and, and, and this sermon series, we're going off and, and, and talking about this mystery and trying to uncover this mystery through the pages of the Bible. And, and, and the question after discovering the mystery last week, the question now becomes, where do we start exploring this mystery, right? Well, l- let me tell you where we're going to start exploring this mystery. We're going to go to Genesis 1, 1 and 2. But why? <clears throat> Pardon me. Why go? Why go back all the way to the beginning to Genesis 1, 1, and 2 in order to uncover this mystery? Isn't Genesis 1, 1 just this, this poetic book that just gives us a story of, of creation? Or, or how about this? answer that maybe you've heard about Genesis 1-1. Isn't Genesis 1 just, aren't there just multiple ways to interpret this? Or how about this one? Couldn't God have used evolution? Hmm. You see, we go back to the beginning. We go back to Genesis 1-1 and 2 because well, quite frankly, creation and evolution, they both have one thing in common, and that is the fact that they cannot be proven without a shadow of a doubt. Um, they are both faith-based. The creation of the world is a faith-based belief. I cannot prove creation any more than an evolutionist can prove their point of view as far as evolution is concerned. Now, With that said, um, I am also talking. I am also talking on the on the sense of proving it scientifically. Okay, I cannot scientifically prove creation. However, I can because I have evidence contained in the pages of the Bible. If I have faith in what God has said in his word. You see, creation and evolution is nothing more than an authority of God issue. If you believe that God created the heavens and the earth, like it says in the Bible, do you have faith in that? There, 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 people that try to, whether they know it or not, and, they, and this is the problem, is that most people don't understand that what they do when they ask the question, is this poetic, or aren't there multiple ways to interpret this, or could God use evolution, most people don't understand what they're actually asking they're actually questioning the authority of God. God. Did God really say? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, That's the same lie that we covered in the last sermon series, The Greatest Magic Show on Earth. It's the same lie that the enemy asked in the garden to Eve. Did God really say? 
That's the question you're asking when you question creation. <sighs> creation, believing in a literal six-day creation, is not a salvation issue directly. It is not a direct salvation issue. However, it is a, an indirect salvation issue. Because if you cannot trust what God says about creation, how in the world are you going to trust him for your salvation? Did God really do what he says he did in the Bible or didn't he? That really is the question. It is the same lie that the enemy put forth in the garden. Did you know Ken Ham came up with this statistic? Um, did you know that 70% of pastors preaching from the pulpit do not believe in a literal six-day creation? 70% of pastors do not believe in a six-day creation. And we wonder why our culture is going to hell in a handbasket. Because it all starts on what I've titled this sermon as, as the foundation. It all starts at the foundation of the fact that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If we cannot believe that simple statement, then none of the rest of the Bible can be trusted or make sense. Okay. Genesis, I, I've got Genesis 1, 1 and, and 2 here. Let me, I, I just read 1, 1. Let me, let me read both of them together here, 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, this next part, for those of you who were a part of the Bible study when we kicked this off in the fall of 2018, this is all going to sound familiar for you guys because you, you, you've heard this before. Um, but basically, let me go through here. Let me go through here and kind of break down Genesis 1, 1, and 2, because here's the thing. There's a lot more going on in Genesis 1, 1, and 2 than what we see on the surface, okay? We, Genesis 1, 1 is probably one of the most popular Bible verses in the Bible. I mean, most people, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Most people can quote that to you. But there's more going on here than what we realize, okay? Got a diagram up on the board behind me, okay? Up in here, you see a box, right? You've got this box right here. And inside of this box is a timeline, right? And this is, you know, from the beginning of time to the end of time. And everything that is in our universe is within this box. God is not within this box because God does not exist in this box because God has created everything that we need in our universe. That includes time, space, and matter. That is the three, three key components to the universe is time, space, and matter. God does not exist inside of this box. Why? Because he created these three constructs and is not bound by any one of the three. He just isn't, okay? God created time, space, and matter. And right now you're going, Pastor, you are nuts. That is nowhere in either one of these verses. Yes, it is. Let me show you. In the beginning, time, God created the heavens, space, and the earth, matter, in the very first verse of the Bible is everything that we need within this universe. Time, space, and matter. God is not bound by time. He is eternal. 
God is not bound by space. He's eternal. <laughs> God is not bound by matter because he's eternal. Okay. God does not exist in the box that we love to put him in. God does not exist in boxes. You see, a lot of times God breaks through barriers and is operating in places that we just can't fathom that God would be working. But he is, and he does. Okay. Also, on another level, within these first two verses, we have other things going on. And what I... Now this this will be this will be new even to those who were in the Bible study, okay? Because this is something that I had begun to figure out when when we started doing the Bible study and when I was doing the study, but I couldn't I, I, I couldn't quite put my finger on what I was grasping at the time. And let me let me kind of propose this idea. That within the first two verses of Genesis, okay, there are four different places that are created in these verses. Okay? The heavens, the earth, the deep, and the waters. Heavens, earth, deep, waters. Okay? Let me read the first two verses again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, time, space, and matter. But also, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Okay? We live... In two worlds. A physical world and a spiritual world. And in those two worlds, there is a physical and then there is a spiritual. There are three different places that are created in the first two chapters. This is not, this is going to become important as we get towards the later part of this sermon series. So this is one of those things that I'm not going to go into great detail about right now, but trust me, this is going to come up at least two more times, if not more. The heavens, the earth, the deep, and the waters. The heavens, obviously, would refer to the heavens, like as in the abode of God, okay? Earth is quite literally the earth. It is what we see, feel here on this planet of ours, right? The heavens are spiritual, the earth is physical. The deep, also, when you look into the Hebrew here, that word deep also translates as sheol. And if you remember right, that word sheol is what? It is the abode of the dead, is it not? What if... Crazy Ryan out in left field, right? You know, I'm just kind of, what if, this is just me kind of proposing this for your consideration. What if the deep is actually created here, is actually Sheol, which means that death was preordained to happen, which means that there would need to be a remedy for that death. The deep was created to hold the dead. Hmm. That's very interesting. The waters. That word in the Hebrew also translates chaos. Think about a boat on water. Um, if you've ever been on a cruise, if you've been ever been out on the boat on the lake, if you've um, you know, cruised up and down a river, you know, in a riverboat, you know, on the Mississippi or whatever kind of river that you've got around. Um, if you've ever been out on a John boat <laughs> fishing, you know, um, any kind of place you've been on the water, right? Very rarely is water picture perfect calm still. 
that doesn't happen very often. So when you get the <laughs> when you get the photographs of the mountain in the distance and that mountain reflecting back on the water, that doesn't happen very often. Waters in and of themselves are very chaotic on a normal day. But then you get the fact that that um, a storm brews up and those waters, you think they're chaotic before. Holy cow, you ain't seen nothing yet until you've been in a, on a, in a boat on a, in a storm. <laughs> um, we, uh, one of our first cruises, we went on a cruise and, and um, one of the nights at dinner, the table or the plates were sliding across the table because the, the waters were so turbulent. Um, there were members of our party that had to go back to the room because it was just a little bit too much for them. Um, waters are chaotic, okay? Waters are very chaotic. You see, both the deep and the waters are places that we cannot actually see. They are spiritual places. And these things are not just something that we can see, feel, hear, taste, and smell. The, these are, it's what I've said, uh, if I've said it once, I've said it a zillion times. These are the places that are just beyond our natural senses that can only be sensed with a spiritual sense of discernment, okay? We live in two worlds. Half of the problem is recognizing that fact. The other half of that fact is recognizing that this simply isn't just the Trinity. That it's not just God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That, that this spiritual realm it includes what the Bible talks about, actual words that the Bible uses as rulers, authorities, powers, principalities. And Exodus 20 and the Ten Commandments calls God's that we put as a lowercase and plural. You see, the Ten Commandments go off, and the first commandment, it says, you shall not have no other gods before me. That's not an issue if there's no other gods, now is there? There's a spiritual realm that we see or there's a spiritual realm that we cannot see that is just beyond our sight, that if the veil was uh, 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 unleashed from before our eyes like it was before Elisha and, and his uh, partner there, that we would fall to the ground in fear because of the world that surrounds us that we cannot see. It includes angels, the fallen angels, which we also call demons. And it includes these rulers and authorities, these powers, these principalities. Daniel 10, let me give an example here of this. Um, just so, you know, I'm again, crazy Ryan out in left field here. But let me tell you what Scripture says, okay? Daniel 10 Daniel is terrified by a vision. He prays to God for an answer for this vision because he, you know, what is it that I'm seeing, Daniel says. Okay, Daniel 10.10 comes and we pick up the story here and it says, Then behold, a hand touched me and sent me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I am about to tell you and I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and hum on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words. Okay, that's 10 through 12. Daniel is visited by an angel who is bringing him a message and an answer to the prayers. Okay? Pay attention to verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. 
Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For if I had been there, if I had been left there with the king, with the kings of Persia, for I had been left there with the kings of, of Persia. Number one, Michael is an archangel, one of the chief princes. Who in the world is the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Ruler, authority, a power, a principality, a little g God. Something in the spiritual realm that we cannot see, we cannot feel, but an influence on that nation Okay, that earthly nation. Hmm. It's your whole ball of crazy for the day. The spiritual world includes way more than just God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It includes more than just the angels in heaven. And I'm not even saying that I fully understand it. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. <laughs> um, these are difficult things to wrap your mind around. They really are because it's like, I can't see this. I can't, I, I, you know, I can't put my fingers on this to be able to figure this out. And, and, and sometimes, you know, we have to be okay with the fact that, you know what, maybe we're not supposed to figure this out. We get enough information of what we need and we trust in God for the rest. Okay. You see, in the previous sermon, I talked about creation versus evolution, supernatural versus natural in the last sermon series. But you'll notice that that sermon was very, very much um, scientific. Okay, I laid out the science of creation and evolution for reason first okay we need to understand that there is scientific evidence okay that has been left behind again we can't prove it but there is scientific evidence left behind that we can observe but here's the biggest problem that we have and and and, and i love ken ham i love the the, the creation ministries because i i support them a hundred percent but here's where they stop short. Most of them, not all of them. Most of them stop short because they engage in this battle on a purely physical level. Creation and evolution is more than just a physical scientific battle. This is an authority of God issue. This is a spiritual issue that must be fought on a spiritual level, not a scientific one. Yes, I, I have done research into the science. I know the science. I love science. <laughs> not everybody does. But this battle, I do not wage this battle against evolution on a purely physical level. I just don't. Because it is a spiritual battle. Our battle, Ephesians goes on to say in chapter 6, our battle is not against flesh and blood. But against what? The rulers and authorities, the powers and the principalities of this dark realm. Yeah, our battle is spiritual. And this is a purely spiritual battle, right? This is a purely spiritual battle. So, we're going to bring up the next slide here. We have on one side, six days. On the opposite side... We have evolution that is said 4.3 billion years. I want you to take a look at those two numbers. And then seriously ask the question whether or not you can fit 4.3 into six days. They're totally incompatible. They're totally incompatible. You see... At some point, if we are going to press on to maturity, if we are going to 
ask and seek and knock and pursue God, we have got to deal with creation. It is going to come. It took me 29 years to deal with creation. It took me 29 years to deal with it. I'd never heard of it up until that point. When it did, it wrecked my world. But creation has got to be dealt with sooner or later. And you have to reconcile 4.3 in six days. This is absolutely, positively foundational to the faith. There is no other way around this, uh, this subject. Creation must be dealt with. And quite frankly, it is a spiritual issue. It is not a physical issue. It is an authority of God issue. Do you trust God or don't you? And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we need to just blindly stick our head in the sand and just, you know, go off in a blind faith. Okay? I'm not saying that. Because again, There is evidence left behind. Are we going to trust it or not? I cannot tell you the depth of my conviction about the six-day literal creation as stated in Genesis 1, 1, 2, and 3. I cannot tell you the depth of my conviction because as I've studied through this, I've seen the evidence revealed before my very eyes. I can sit here and I can preach on it and I can, I can lay this out of what I've learned and what I've discovered and, 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 and I will always qualify it as though it's Ryan, a crazy Ryan out in the left field because I understand, I understand how absolutely ludicrous some of this stuff sounds. I just do. I, I, I understand how crazy some of these ideas just, it's like, it, dude, what are you talking about? But as I've studied, I, the depth of, con, of the conviction that I've seen, I just, I can't unsee this stuff. I mean, I have no doubt in my mind that this happened exactly the way that it's lined out in scripture here. I have no doubt of that. That used to be a doubt in my mind when I was first confronted with this stuff. There, are, there were so many different ways that I tried to fit in, and I can go through the theories with you. Know, you got the gap theory, that there's a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 2 and the rest of, or Genesis 1, 1 and the rest of Genesis 1, you know, and the rest of that, that chapter there. It's called the gap theory, where they, they fit in thousands and millions of billions of years in there. Or there's the there's another theory where you try to fit the 4.3 billion years into each of the days of creation that a day is, is not actually a, a literal day, but it's actually just some kind of convoluted, poetic kind of way of saying that, um, you know, this is all, uh, it, it, this all happened and, and, you know, God used evolution. Well, number one, um, if God used evolution and there was death before, death before sin, and that didn't happen. Um, number two, the word that is used for day, it's called yom. Um, it's the same day, the, the, word, the same word for day that is used throughout the rest of Scripture. Um, a day is a day, <laughs> the last time I checked. A day is a day. Now, there are some th scientific theories I can go in through and tell you about, <laughs> um, but a day is still a day because time is a created construct. And time moves differently to, based on um, gravitational pull. I'm starting to get scientific, so I'll just kind of stop right there. But there are theories, not proven fact, but theories behind that, that could explain some of this stuff, right? You know, there are two atomic clocks. I, I will say this. There are two atomic clocks, one at sea level in London. The other one is up in the mountains over in, oh, Himalayan mountains somewhere. 
And every so often, they have to reconcile the two clocks because they end up off because of the difference in elevation and gravity. Time moves faster and slower depends on, depending on gravitational pull. Um, it, it's actually a very interesting, very interesting issue. Um, but there are many people that try to force 4.3 billion into six days. They are incompatible. You can't do it. It doesn't make any sense. When I was a kid, it wasn't 4.3 billion. When I was a kid, it was like 2.5, 2.1 billion years. It's only gotten longer. Um, I hate to say it, but the longer you make it, doesn't make it more plausible. <laughs> John 3.12. I'm going to start to wrap this up. John 3.12. Jesus is speaking here to Nicodemus. And this is right before the ever famous verse of John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Okay. Listen to what he tells Nicodemus in verse 12. He says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? If God tells us about the earthly things at the beginning of Genesis, and we don't believe that, how in the world are we going to believe him when he talks about the spiritual realm and, and his salvation and, and, and all of that? How, how are we going to believe that? We don't. You can't. This is an, creation is an indirect salvation issue. It is not a direct, whether or not you believe in creation doesn't affect the fact that you can or can't be saved or are or aren't be saved. I'm going to be saved. But it is an indirect salvation issue because if you can't trust in the creation that is stated in the Bible, how are you going to trust Jesus Christ for your, sal for your salvation? At some point, we have got to deal with the truth of creation. At some point, we cannot dance around it forever. I full well believe that God created in chapter 1 and then in Genesis 2, he relayed this information to Adam. Adam heard the creation story directly from God. Adam then relays this information to his wife, who has to hear with faith. If you map out how long everybody lived, Adam, Seth, all the way up to Noah, you will find that Noah would have had a first-hand recounting of the Garden of Eden and creation from Adam's own mouth. Noah would have heard the creation account from Adam himself. That is absolutely incredible. And when we go to a court of law, eyewitness accounts are held as premium. The Bible has more eyewitness accounts than any other book on the face of the planet. At some point, we have got to deal with creation. And this is the question that I leave you with. Did he or didn't he? And that's all there, ha that's all there is to it. Did he or didn't he? At some point, we've got to wrestle with that question. And as we go on, we are going to find that this idea of faith, because creation is a faith-based issue, it is a, an authority of God issue, we are going to find out that by faith, God created the world. 
And this issue of faith is at the core from cover to cover. Where are you at this morning? Did you realize that we live in two worlds? Did you realize that there were four different places created in the beginning? I didn't. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that I even began to think that. When I first started going through this, this Bible study for, for us here. I had not ever put that together. Trust God, guys. He will reveal what he needs to reveal you when you're ready to see it, when you're ready to hear it. Some of these things, some of these things that I've said today are out in left field. I understand that they're crazy. Toy with them, play around with them. If they fall, fall to the ground, then, then, then so be it. And that's okay. Um, again, our salvation is based on our faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, and it is not, it's just like what Sherry said in the devotion this morning. Just because Easter is over does not mean Easter is over. The resurrection is celebrated by Christians every day we get up. We live in that Zoe life, that e eternal life, that, that life in the spiritual realm while we exist here in the physical and Jesus tells us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul and strength and the second commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself that is what this is all about